and Happy New Year. I'm Mark Schlag, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea to Maui, the Valley Isle, to meet Shannon Sheldon. Shannon is a partner in the law firm of McKeon Sheldon Mailing, which is located in Wailuku, Maui. As the new Hawaii State Bar Association president, Shannon is leading Hawaii lawyers into 2022. I've asked Shannon to talk about her background and her views of Hawaii and current events. Welcome, Shannon. It's good to see you. Thank you. Great to see you, Mark. And thank you to you and ThinkTech for, for doing this. OK, I want to get right into it. Uh, let's pretend that we are meeting for the first time. And, and actually, today is our first even virtual meeting, but at a HSBA event. Uh, and how would you introduce yourself to me? I mean, who is Shannon Sheldon? How would you describe yourself? And why did you become a lawyer? Well, my 30-second elevator speech would be, hi, I'm Shannon Sheldon. I'm the current president of the Hawaii State Bar. I'm an attorney who practices condominium and community association law on Maui. But as we got to talking, especially if there was a glass of wine involved, I'd probably tell you that um, I'm a 45-year-old woman from uh, originally from Los Angeles, California, more specifically Pasadena, California. I'm a proud mother, single mother, actually, of two daughters. I'm Jewish, and I currently live up country in Maui. That's my that's my personal life. Okay, well, that's that is a lot in a short time. Thank you. That's a good good description. Good good to get to know you. Good to learn about you. You mean you're a new president, and you're and you're from of the Bar Association, you're from Maui, and I, I mean, you're on Maui, but you're not from Maui, and you, you, you came from the mainland to Hawaii, and what, what attracted you to come and live in Hawaii in the first place, and what do you like about living and working in Hawaii? I, I, I assume you do, and that's why you're calling it your home. Yes, I've been here for 17 years, two years on Oahu, and the remainder on Maui, um, I feel really lucky as a kid, I got to come to Oahu first and then Maui with my grandparents, two different sets of grandparents. And as a kid, when you see that fire dancer and hula show for the first time and you've had shave ice you, in the Paris at the international marketplace, I mean, you fall in love with Hawaii. So that's, of course, the superficial uh, aspect of it. But um, as you live in Hawaii, you realize that it's you're really lucky to be here and it's the people that make these islands special um, in California I could not call the county and get a live person here I can call on um, Maui I can call you know planning department not only get a live person but chances are I know them or I know their auntie right and so that to me is the beauty of living in the islands is that it is a small population for those who live here and um it's friendlier and people are nicer in general. So that is um, primarily why I love living in Hawaii. And so that, that attracted you to Hawaii, those uh, human elements. And, and but, but you also made the decision, I mean, you don't just come here for vacation. You, you, you live here and you work here. And the, there, you know, a lot of kids, a lot of local Hawaii kids leave. Hawaii. Uh, and, and so, I mean, what, what's the difference there? What, what kept you uh, in Hawaii to work? And I, and I know you've also worked and lived in many other locations, uh, um, California, uh, South Carolina, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, uh, you're close, North Carolina. North Carolina, okay. And, and, and so you lived in di different locations, but you ultimately chose Hawaii, and then I'll, I'll get into Maui in a bit, but I mean, what kept you or brought you and kept you working here when so many of our local kids leave? And what is there something that we can learn about that that will help keep local kids here? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I, one of my personal agendas as the bar president is to try to 
fight what I've called or people call the brain drain, right, of local kids moving to the mainland, getting jobs there that do tend to pay more, you know, depending on where you live. Um, and we lose some of our brightest and most successful students to the mainland. I um, personally, you know, was as a first year attorney, probably making double or three times of what I made as a, a 10 year attorney here in Hawaii, right? So I understand why people move because it's a financial choice, but really financial cannot replace the values and the opportunities that you get living in Hawaii. Um, specifically, if I was on the mainland, if I was in California, I'm one of hundreds of thousands of attorneys, the chances of me ever being able to become bar president were probably zero to none, um, no matter how achieved and involved I was, um, because there is just this rat race that occurs you know, in California or other states that you don't get here. Here in Hawaii, you are rewarded, I think, on good, for good work, for working hard, you know, and it's not always about who you know, but the people you do know, you get to establish these mentors that will really help build you and carry you through your practice. Um, I think the number one reason why anyone should want to work in Hawaii is because you can achieve and practice law in any field you really want to. If you want to be, you know, the public defender, you have an opportunity. If you want, even if you want to be a Supreme Court justice, you don't necessarily have to have gone to Harvard um, to do so. You can, you can achieve that being here. And so I think that is the biggest draw um, for me is that it just provided a lot of opportunity. Um, and, and again, the people, uh, the mentors I've established along the way have been, have been wonderful. And do, you, and do you try to communicate that to, the, to young kids? Is that, is that what you're trying to do? I do, yeah. I, I, sorry, go ahead. So you're talking about humanity in a way, something that's even greater than monetary reward, if you will. Although money's important, I, I, I you know, money's good, but I, I can see that your focus is on something else. Yes, there's. I don't think you can put a price on um, human connections. And you, and you can't put a price on being able to work in a field that you love or that you desire or getting to choose your opportunities. Um, and that is that is what Hawaii presents, I think, for our students. I did teach um, business law and international business law at the um, Mount UH Maui. And um, I would, I would encourage the students, go to law school if you can, um, stay in Hawaii. Unfortunately, the practic practical situation is we have one law school in Hawaii, it's on Oahu, and there is no remote possibilities on any other islands. So if you do want to go to law school here, you, you have to move to Oahu. Um, that's a barrier, unfortunately, to some of our brightest students on the neighbor island that I would like to help try to fix. Okay. And you know, you, you've talked about a couple things here. Uh, you practice law on Oahu, I know, and you also have moved, but you moved to Maui and you set up a firm in Maui. You know, what, why did you do that? You know, I mean, we all know that most of the lawyers in Hawaii are on Oahu. Most, uh, although we, we practice on, on various islands also from Oahu, but you chose Maui. What? I mean, Maui no Ka'oi? Is that is that the <laughs> message? Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> uh, well, I love Oahu. I'm not one of those neighbor islanders that go to Oahu and are disgusted with the traffic. I'm originally from LA, so the traffic, you know, doesn't bother me. Um, I love the food on Oahu. And when I, I was practicing in California as a patent attorney, um, and I applied for a firm which actually had an office on Oahu as well. It was Paul Johnson Park and Niles. And they had the Maui office and I had the opportunity to go to either. Um, I purposely selected Maui 
mostly because I'm an adventure junkie and I like new things. And I had not lived on Maui. I'd already lived on Oahu. Um, I really connected with who is now my partner, Bill McKeon. He's from the same area that I practice now. Another attorney named Dennis Niles, also from California. Um, and I liked the smaller town feel of Maui. When I first interviewed, I took a walk into um, Wailuku town. It's old, it's, it's historic. It's a little rundown, um, but it just has this gorgeous, nostalgic, old Hawaii feel, especially when you look up into the valley and you see Iao. And um, that was it. That's That walk sold me and actually determined my fate. And then I feel uh, lucky that I have practiced on Maui because it's a small, a small bar. I feel like I know almost every attorney on Maui. I know the judges um, and it's, it's a really wonderful place to practice law. And, you know, you, okay, so, but you, you still wanted to be the president of the bar. Why did you want to become president of Hawaii State Bar? And you, I mean, you must have known that it must be a little harder from someone from Maui to get to that role because mostly Oahu lawyers fill the bar presidency. What, why, what, what motivated you? I, I am big on community service and giving back um, as cheesy as that may sound. Um, I was a recipient of um, the opportunity to do what's called the Leadership Institute Program. And I think maybe you've, you've heard of that. It's, it's set up by the bar. It's I think um, attorneys that have been practicing three to 11 years are eligible. And um, I, you go and you meet with you know, judges and leaders of Hawaii, and you get to ask them questions. And it's a really valuable program. And I really wanted to give back to the bar for that program. I also wanted to give back to the bar because I did, you know, a semester abroad at UH uh, Manoa, you know, at William S. Richardson Law School. And I met so many amazing attorneys playing in the Ette Bowl, um, both on the Bruiser side and the Ette side. And I, I um, really felt like these a lot of these attorneys, especially um, the professors like Denise Antolini, Casey Jarman, John Van Dyke, they took me under their wing. They um, really developed me as a law student. And I always feel like there is that gratitude and debt to pay to our bar for those who really helped me in Hawaii. You know, one thing you mentioned, uh, you, you took I, was it a year off from your your Loyola Law School and went to UH? Is that right? Is that it was a semester. I also noticed that as an undergraduate, you spent a year in in New Zealand. Is that right? Yes, in Dunedin on the South Island. And and I mean, so I guess that goes to your adventurous nature, as you were mentioning. But I mean, what, what about that New Zealand? Why did you go to a foreign country? And and for a year, what, what was that about? Well, I, so I was um, an environmental biology major. I wasn't your typical pre-law student or criminal justice student. Um, I really thought I was going to go into environmental law. And then the school I chose, University of Otago, had a, a great environmental law, um, well, and I'm sorry, environmental biology program where we were in the field daily um, you know, taking water samples and whatnot. And it was um, an incredible experience. I also at the time thought about, you know, eventually moving to New Zealand. It's a nuclear free country. I love islands. I got there. Um, I was on the South Island. There were penguins. It, I believe, is the most Southern university in the world. And it was, you know, four degrees. <laughs> so, so needless to say, I wasn't going to stay in New Zealand, although it was an incredible experience. Um, and it did help that they are English speaking and my foreign language skills are not very good. So that is also why I chose New Zealand. I see. Yeah. And was, was that international? I, I, I'm been involved in the international law section of Hawaii Bar for quite a lot, number of years. Was that experience? How did you rate that? How was that? Was that good for you? Or, you know, is it good for you now? Uh, what do you feel about that? I remember being there and saying to myself, this is going to be the best year of your life. And it was <laughs> like, I, I knew it. Um, it. 
you the growth, especially at that age when you're in college um, and you're so selfish in college, right? And it's all about you. Um, you really don't have a, much in the way of responsibilities. You have a job maybe, you know, and you've got, you got to get through class, but you don't necessarily have a family or kids. You don't, you know, you get to really be spoiled. And then, and then being in America, you don't realize how privileged we are until you go to a foreign country. And New Zealand, you know, it's, it's a first world country, but it's still, um, you, you know, there was no central heat. I mean, I slept every night in a beanie and gloves. Um, there, it's not like you go into the grocery store and have hundreds of options of candy bars, right? So it's, um, it was very valuable in realizing, you know, the world should not necessarily revolve around America and the United, the United States. Um, and that you've got to learn to adjust to other social situations, other people. And, um, and then of course, just the adventure and traveling. I did a lot of traveling alone and I went to Australia and Indonesia and Fiji while I was there. And those, you know, just that travel alone taught me a lot about, um, you know, it's basic, not, you know, not basic survival skills, but um, how to do without. You don't need all the luxuries that we have. And did you build relationships well in with people in different countries that, that way too? Absolutely. I still actually a couple months ago just talked talk to a friend of mine, um, another friend of mine. She's um, she was at Earth Justice for a while. She became a lawyer as well. So so yes, I developed relationships. I also I was a soccer player, so I played on their team. Wow. Um, on the Otago's team, and I got to um, play in their Olympic tryouts, <laughs> which was which was an incredible experience. And I'm still friends, um, you know, social media friends with some of those soccer players. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, yeah. Now, you know, you you mentioned that you were thinking about uh, you know environmental biology. Why did you become a lawyer? Well, what changed? What 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 road did you take? <laughs> That was New Zealand's fault and the cold's fault. So we would be out there for hours in a pond or a lake collecting guppies or whatever the animal was. Um, and then you'd sit for hours in a computer lab running statistics. And I realized maybe environmental biologists <laughs> not, <laughs> it's not, you're not out with Gwen and monkeys, you know, parading in jungles, like they make it look like in National Geographic, right? So um, I remember the LSAT was being offered. I had a week before, it, you know, I signed up. I, I didn't take a class. I didn't study. I don't recommend that. But um, and I, I might have been the first and only person ever to take the LSAT in Dunedin, New Zealand. And so it was really more a backup plan, although the seed had been implanted in my brain. My father is a patent attorney. Um, I think he was thrilled to hear when I <laughs> took the LSAT. So, um, so that was the reason for the career switch. And then, uh, and then I went straight from college to law school and I've been an attorney for 20 years. Okay. And during that time, uh, you worked for your dad. How was that? What was that like? You, part of that time was with your dad and then you, you went to uh, other states. What, 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 what was going on? Um, so, I, yeah, so I actually right out of law school, I worked for my dad's competitor. Um, I took the patent bar. I was a patent attorney because, um, you know, you don't want to work for your dad right away. <laughs> <laughs> so although, we, you know, and um, and then I did eventually go work for my dad. He is the best mentor I've ever had. You know, he's he's brilliant. Um, he took the time. Um, I'm really thankful for that experience. But because he is such a successful and achieved attorney in his own right, I didn't always want to be known as Jeff Sheldon's daughter. You know, I wanted to pave my own path. And so that was also part of the impetus of moving to, to Maui and leaving his firm um, was to, you know, start my, start my own practice, start my own career. Um, and lo and behold, I still do a lot of trademark work. I hardly do any patent. Um, I do some copyright, but really my um, bread and butter is doing condominium association law, which I never in a million years would have done unless I had probably moved to Hawaii. 
So it is, and, and it's a very fitting practice for my personality. So it was, uh, it was a good move for me. And, and you talked uh, a lot about, um, you know, your development. Now, what, what would you tell a young lawyer that would make them a good lawyer? What, what, are, what are the traits of a good lawyer uh, from based on your experience and your adventures uh, out there? What could, what could you tell a young lawyer now? I think the first trait is compassion. We lose sight of that as attorneys, especially when we're trying to respond to hundreds of clients and, and thousands of emails. Um, but if you have ever personally been in litigation, and I hope you haven't, Mark, um, but I have, um, it's horrible. And you, you, know, you don't want your deposition. You don't want to go to trial. It's so stressful. And so I think compassion is one, the number one trait you need to have as an attorney. You have to try to step in their shoes and remember how it can feel with that type of stress um, and uncertainty. And with that compassion, then you're going to make good decisions on behalf of your client. You're not going to make decisions because you want to make more money, right? You're going to look for settlement or solutions and be solution oriented as opposed to just spinning your wheels or fighting with opposing counsel. Um, so to me, that is the number one trait. The number two trait, I would say, is communication skills. Um, as attorneys, we are reading and writing and special emails all the time. You have to have strong communication skills. You have to be able to talk to someone in a, in a manner that they understand what direction you're taking their case. And so um, the most useful class I ever took that my dad made me take actually, and I hated it at the time because I wanted to take uh, art you know, or drama, but I, he made me take speed reading in summer school. And I, I don't think they offer it anymore, but I wish they did. That was the most valuable class because I read hundreds of emails a day. <laughs> so it's very useful. I really like that answer, you know, compassion and communication. That, that, those are really, I mean, you could teach a class on that. I, maybe you have, but that's, that is really uh, good advice. Um, you know, and I, let, me, let me ask you for some more advice. Uh, you know, in, in, a, in our American society right now, um, there's a lot of divisions and uh, aggravated by lawsuits and you know, legal actions and lawyers. And, is, and that adds, of course, to the stress of the pandemic. Uh, is there anything that lawyers and bar associations, especially now with your position, is there anything that can be done to help those divisions be healed or reduce the stress? That's an excellent question. And this, this is the one that actually keeps me up at night because I think when you're in a leadership position, you are looking for solutions. You're looking to help our members, right? Um, I think that the best way to deal with the political strife you know, you didn't say that, but I, I think that might be what you're alluding to, um, is for the bar to provide opportunities on both sides. Um, so for example, if there is going to be a CLE where um, there is a presenter who was, you know, Trump's counsel, you know, President Trump's counsel, or there's going to be a presenter for Obama's counsel, we allow both. Right, and we do as a bar. We are very open-minded to allowing both um, sides of the coin to express their views. And where we have to be mindful is the members themselves need to be open-minded. We it does it doesn't help anyone when you're on the attack or when you're on the defensive necessarily. You you don't have to agree, obviously, and we won't. But it's it is respectful to give people their platform. Let them say what they want to say as long as it's not harassing, racist, sexist, you know, and, um, and, and let them have their say. And at the end of the day, if you don't agree, don't agree, but do not attack. Because um, I think that is part of the division is when people are shutting down the other side, 
right? And people just sometimes want to be heard. We, we hear that with our clients, right? We hear that with the opposing opposing parties. They just want to be heard. And that's you know why mediations tend to be successful because they're finally getting to be heard. So I think if we apply those same principles um, to our membership, uh, we hopefully can mend some of, some of the strife that has happened. Uh, more good advice. I, I appreciate that. That That is also, I think, a trademark of a good lawyer probably too, is to allow people to say and talk. Yeah, I like that. Um, now, with respect to your beginning as the HSBA president, I guess you've had a couple days already, uh, <laughs> but what are your priorities for the year? What what are you looking for? What do you want to develop as the president? Well, the priority for the last two years um, under both Greg um, Frey, which I don't know if you got to interview him, and Levi, both who were excellent presidents, um, they every president that comes in has their personal agenda and they I'm sure have their personal agendas. And unfortunately for them, whatever their agenda would have gotten thrown aside because of COVID and we're dealing with all those hurdles um, that are being thrown at the HSBA. And I was hoping in 2022, I would get <laughs> to not have to deal with that. But obviously that's not the case with our numbers at a record high. So my agenda item, my priority will have to be and, and will be, you know, keeping our members safe, but connected during COVID. Um, our struggle for the HSBA right now is the last two years, we have not been able to hold our annual dinner. And hence that means less money. And, and what that means is less money for our programs that really need it, like YLD and our, you know, our public outreach programs. So my second pri priority, in addition to trying to keep our members safe, is to raise funds in alternative ways. I think we're looking at doing a silent auction, um, eat, whether or not we hold a, a bar dinner, but we'll do a silent auction, which will hopefully allow um, to raise funds to go to these programs. Okay, uh, we have about a minute left. And in that minute, I wanna ask you, what have you learned? over the past couple of years from all the things that have been going on about life and law? What, what, what has affected you? What, what have you learned? I feel like we might have all learned, we've all heard this word pivot, right? Another word for that would be, be flexible. Um, you, you can plan all you want. It's just gonna get, get thrown out the window. Um, so you have to be resilient, you have to be flexible um, and you, you can't let the bastards drag you down. Um, you've always got to look, at least I do, I try to always look for that silver lining and there always tends to be one. And that's been my motto that's been getting me through the last couple of years. Okay, well, Shannon, uh, as the new president, I, uh, I'm very impressed uh, and, and thankful that we have you to lead us into the new, new year. Uh, I appreciate you being my guest today and uh, look forward to what the future holds. Aloha. Aloha, thank you, Mark, it was a pleasure.